Hi, and welcome to Gartner Live. In this third episode of our Future of Work Reinvented series, we'll talk about how do you survive innovation and collaboration in a new work environment, especially hybrid workmen. In a recent Gartner survey, 71% of HR leaders said that they're concerned about employee collaboration more this year than they were before the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we'll discuss whether you should worry about your employees and whether they'll have trouble collaborating and innovating when some of their colleagues return to the workplace and others are still working remotely or in a hybrid work environment. I'm Heather Pemberton Levy, Vice President of Content Marketing. Joining me today are Mary Masalio, Managing Vice President with Gartner's CEO and Digital Futures research group, and Brent Castle, Vice President in the Gartner HR Practice. Welcome, Mary and Brent. Hey, Heather. Thank you. Hi, Heather. Thank you for inviting us. Let's start by talking about what you're hearing from our clients. Is this really a common concern right now, Mary? Uh, Heather, the answer to that is a resounding yes. My life consists of days and days of calls about exactly this topic. How do we return to work? What is it going to look like? I'm worried about the collaboration environment. We have three potential environments we have to manage now, you know, all remote, all in office and potentially hybrid. And I'm not sure how to do that. What about innovation? So yeah, I would say 100% this is absolutely a top concern for clients right now in all geographies and all sectors. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about that because you write frequently about digital transformation and culture and particularly how those intersect. It's been a big topic, a lot of acceleration there over the last year, but now what happens as the work environment drastically changes? So I think we it's really important that we remember that large enterprises basically sucked at innovation anyway before the pandemic as a rule. So this was not something we were all amazing at that suddenly the pandemic made harder. So large enterprises generally assassinate innovation from the inside out, not on purpose, while the CEO is standing up and saying innovation is the lifeblood of our enterprise. So it's not like this was something we were great at. And I think now it's exacerbated by a more complex work environment where people are together and people are apart. And one of the things that we see working is a principles-based approach, which I totally get sounds like a fancy analyst consulting -y thing. What I really mean is the specifics of how we do this, whether it's two days or three days or Wednesdays or Thursday, the specifics are probably gonna change and we need to experiment and adjust as we go. But having a few principles that um, anchor everybody and give them some certainty, like this is our intent, this is what we're going for, is really important. And those principles should have a longer lifespan. So, you know, pursuing collaboration equity, where your contribution is measured on your, uh, your participation and your efforts, not on your location, for example, as a principle, how that works hard to figure out in the details, but having it as a principle matters. Or we're gonna co-create the ground rules together with our employees because they've earned the right to have a say. This is a useful principle to guide the effort. So early data suggests that um, using a few principles to guide what your intent is and being really intentional about this, what kind of environment you're trying to create for innovation and collaboration and just work in general is a really good way to do it, even if you have to adjust the details as you go. Absolutely. Brent, you've done a lot of work with clients on the idea of capturing collaboration opportunities. What's changed in the past year? Yeah. Um, so I, before COVID, right, in the in-person environment, we, we relied a great deal on, on what we and the, the research team refer to as serendipitous collaboration, right? The, the so-called happy accidents, your water cooler conversations, running into an old friend in the cafeteria. Uh, and we, we found that often these, these unexpected moments were the sources of, of some of our best ideas, right? We, we all read Creativity Inc. It was a heck of a book. We all wish that we could innovate like Pixar. However, when, when folks went remote last spring, uh, we lost that serendipity. It, it, it just wasn't possible anymore. And, and we sought to re recreate it by scheduling more and, and more and more meetings, right? And, and that worked, 
to an extent, but, but it's resulted in higher levels of emotional and physical fatigue. I, I, we see this very clearly in our research, and, and I would imagine uh, that we're all experiencing this to various degrees in our own life, right? So if, if, if you feel that you are suffering from Zoom fatigue, know that it is not your imagination and know that you are not alone. Um, and I think it's important to know that we were, in doing so, in pursuing that strategy, we were neglecting a, a critical component of innovation, right? That deep focus time. You know, it's, it's hard to reach the elusive and all-powerful flow state when we are in back-to-back -back meetings. Now, of course, collaboration, whether it be in person or virtual, is, is going to be a central part to any sort of innovation strategy. And we want to preserve that at all costs. However, the, the new principle that guides our approach to, to work design in the hybrid environment is what we call innovation by design, not simply innovation by chance. And Mary, that that type of you know innovation by chance is that is that something that is 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 attainable? I I think it's totally attainable, and the design part I think really matters. So to build on what Brent was saying, and I don't know Brent if this is what you intended, but this is how I interpret this. Okay, I think. Um, we have just got this reflex reaction that is, oh, we have to do some work. Let's just have a Teams meeting or just put an hour on my calendar or like a Zoom meeting or whatever your, whatever your conferencing tool of choice is. Just throw it into a meeting and we'll make it for an hour or like the super innovative companies like, oh, we'll make it for 55 minutes, right? And then people have five minutes of the fire. So this reflex reaction, I think what's happening is by design, at least is how I interpret this. Brent, you correct me if I'm wrong, is we have to be a bit more rigorous about the kinds of conditions that are required to do good work. So I have a feeling you're about to talk about synchronous and asynchronous work, Brent, and I don't wanna steal your, your thunder, but I do wanna say this, it really matters that people start to ask themselves individually, under what conditions do I do my best work? Like under what conditions do I have my best ideas? So for some people, this is monastic silence staring at a white wall in total um, isolation, right? For other people, like for me, if you said, Mary, under what conditions do you have your best ideas? I would say, and I totally get that everybody viewing this is gonna think this is vaguely insane, many people would, okay? But for me, it's been demonstrated to me in my career that my best ideas happen on stage in front of a thousand people when someone asks me a really hard question. Like under pressure, I suddenly go, oh, I have to respond and I have a great idea that I probably would not have had if I didn't have that extra pressure on stage, eyes on me, et cetera, right? So I think one of the things people can do is ask themselves, under what conditions do I have my best ideas and do I do my best work? Some people have to walk, some people have to move. It's just useful to know this. If you ask people, they actually usually know, they just haven't thought about it. And then you say, okay, well, how can I architect my day so that some of those best ideas occur. How can I make sure my day includes those conditions, whether it's on stage in front of a thousand people virtually or not, or you know, in monastic silence, kind of lone wolf style. I think people have different styles and we need to be a bit more rigorous about designing around those. Yeah. I think this is how we architect and intentionally plan to have it by chance, right? To get those moments of inspiration and innovation by chance in a more design moment with these new ways of working. We should ask our viewers to just start posting in the comments how they get their inspiration and the crazy ways. I get mine on walks in the woods. If I can't go for a walk, it's very hard uh, to get all that deep thinking. I like that deep state of flow you were talking about, Brent. But uh, Mary, I also wanna follow up with this question, which is, what about, you know, so we have we have organizations that are trying to figure out how to set this up intentionally or find moments to create chance with hybrid working or with workers all over the place. But then we also have organizations that are having workers come back to on-site locations. Is this something they're dealing with as well? So yeah, going back to my original comment, it's not like we were acing innovation in the main before the pandemic, right? So if you ask your average, there were lots of studies where you would ask senior executives, why is your enterprise not more innovative? This is a study that's from years ago from McKinsey, right? Why is your enterprise not more innovative? Response from senior executives. We're waiting for the ideas from the troops. I stand up at the town hall. I say innovation is the life, but we're going to innovate. Where are the ideas? I'm waiting, right? You ask the same question. Why is your enterprise not more innovative? You ask frontline employees, what's their response? 
nobody's listening to my ideas. Like what? We have people who have authority, decision-making power and interest and budget and want innovation. And then we have people who have ideas and yet nothing's happening. So this is pre-pandemic. We weren't that good at it, right? So yes, those who are going back in the office are still struggling with how are we gonna innovate. Those who are managing hybrid environments are struggling with the same things with the exacerbating question of, oh my gosh, what does this mean for us? One thing I would encourage every viewer to do is I feel like during the pandemic, we've learned that maybe testing our assumptions is a good idea. So pre-pandemic assumptions that peppered most management teams that I worked with. We can't get a quality outcome unless we're in an office. If we let people work from home, it's gonna to be total chaos and people are gonna skive off and do nothing. I can only know if my people are productive if they're sitting in front of me in an office environment. And all of these, you know, in the main, generally speaking, people brought it during the pandemic, working more hours, being more productive. Leadership teams are addicted to that higher productivity now and are wondering how they're gonna do it with commutes involved, right? So none of those assumptions turned out to be really true. So what I would hate to see is if we all came back and said, oh, but you know, we have this untested assumption, but it must be true that in order to innovate, oh my gosh, we gotta be in the office. So we're just gonna make, really? Are we sure? Because lots of organizations have been running global teams that were in different time zones and different geographies for a very long time, way pre-pandemic. And we're trying to innovate with those teams that weren't in the same office at the same time, doing the work physically together. So I think it's just really important for people to not lose the rigor. We just came off the world's biggest social experiment where we found many of our assumptions were really not true. So let's not go back to, well, because I'm, a, I'm in the leadership team, I'm, I'm just going to do a black box decision and arbitrarily decide innovation has to happen in an in-person environment. We should probably be rigorous and test that. Yeah, Brent, I, I can imagine that the HR practice has been doing a lot of new research and evolving and iterating new ways of collaborating for where we are today. Can you share with us some of where that that thinking has gone? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things we're, we're encouraging our clients to do is, is really take a step back and realize that there are a lot of different ways that we work together. There are many ways that we collaborate. We can be co-located or distributed. It can occur uh, synchronously or asynchronously. But to, to Mary's point, the, the challenge is that most companies default toward synchronous collaboration because number one, it, it's the way we've always done things around here. Uh, and because we, we tend to assume that those methods of collaboration, whether we are physically located in a conference room or, or, or whether we are all uh, on a Zoom together, kind of Brady Bunch style, uh, we assume that this is what will drive team innovation. But one of the most surprising things that we learned in our research this year is that it simply isn't true, right? We found that, that asynchronous collaboration is just as important to team innovation as synchronous collaboration. The problem though is that we're just not investing in it as much as we should be. So, I mean, yes, I mean, some folks are making headlines by implementing you know, meeting free Monday or, or Zoom free Friday, but at about 17% of companies, they are decidedly in the minority. And, and, and to be clear, it is not our intent to lionize or demonize any one mode of, of collaboration over the others. Right? I, I find myself saying on a regular basis that the, the rumors of the demise of the office are greatly exaggerated. Uh, however, we do believe very strongly that the most successful companies in the hybrid environment will be the ones that embrace all four modes of collaboration that we identify. Okay, now- Can I just now one on here for one sec? I just want to test a, an innovation that, so Brent, I want to know what you think of this. So viewers probably think that research analysts like us spend all day, you know, having beautiful, wonderful, innovative thoughts and that we, we spend like lots of time actually writing research. But the truth is well, you have to I, find, I, find I, that I, time. I, <laughs> <laughs> you have to fight to find the time to, to, to do the research because it's interrupt driven. You know, I'm talking to clients, I'm talking to events, I'm talking, I'm doing an event, I'm doing a research briefing. And so my friend and colleague, Brian Burt, I think it was Brian, came up with this concept, okay, called the 90 minute note session. So 
This is an innovation that includes, it's always remote because Gartner is, from a research point of view, has been remote for mostly for decades. I've been working at a home office for 20 years, right? So, um, so always remote. So we're not in the same physical location, but the asynchronous synchronous thing, right? So we struggle to find time to actually write. So he goes, okay, let's do a 90 minute note session, 30 minutes synchronous work. So we're on a call together talking about what we're going to write about, coming up with some definitional parameters and putting some anchors into the note. 30 minutes, we both go away, disconnect and write as fast as we can. We, there's a little bit of urgency and we got to get back. So I'm not, you know, if you don't have the urgency that it's suddenly like, I feel like I should clean my office and I'm totally going to get to the writing of the research as soon as I upload the document. I'm just going to end up sending that in this realistically. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so 30 minutes, so you got to like get down to business, write and do as much as you can. Right. And then 30 minutes coming back. So this is the last 30 minutes of the 90 minutes of, okay, what did you get? What did I get? Let's put it together. Let's see if we have a rough draft. And this forcing mechanism of sort of, we go from synchronous, then we go to asynchronous, but, but time boxed, really time boxed. Then we go to synchronous again. I think really, really upped our productivity and efficiency. We weren't using the terms synchronous and asynchronous and being all fancy. We were just saying, you know, go and get some work done and to, to Heather's point about being in this flow state. So I just wanted to play that off you and see what you thought of that as our little mini tactical innovation to actually write. Yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic idea, right? It's, it's the old joke, right? Did this need to be a meeting? And, and often the answer is no. So I think that's a perfect example, right? That that is both synchronous and asynchronous occurring while we are uh, uh, not in the same physical location. I think it's a great example of what it looks like to really consciously and intentionally shift between those modes to give folks the opportunity to brainstorm out loud. Uh, for, for those of us who do our thinking out loud, that is where we come up with our, our, our best ideas. But then it gives us an opportunity to reflect and think before coming back together. Uh, and I think this is important, not only from the standpoint of innovation, uh, but also from the standpoint of, of inclusion, because there are going to be on any high performing team, you're going to have extroverts, you're going to have introverts, you're going to have people who are energized by the uh, sometimes combative or performative energy that comes with a, a, a really high, uh, high stakes meeting. And then there's going to be people who find that just the, the, the opposite of inspiring, who just tune out, who feel overwhelmed by it, who need that time to kind of put their head down, think deep thoughts and, and like write it out. So I think creating meetings or creating collaboration opportunities that, that allow for, for both modes, I think is, is a fantastic idea. And one that I will be stealing uh, in, in the near future. So thank you for, for that. One. Copyright, Brian Burke. This was not my idea, but it does work really well. For me. So if you, if you have more research, you need to turn out more in the second half of the, the year. I want to hear how that goes for you. I would just point out, really? you know, I've been talking to leadership teams all day and I literally never, I've never heard anyone say, you know, Mary, it's just, I just wish I had more meetings, you know, I just feel like I don't have no. enough. Like no one, is, no one is saying, "This is like this is soul destroying work." I can't, I can't hack it. You know, Heather, I'm sure you feel the same way. I don't know. Yeah. Well, well I'll, I think I'll that the meeting issue is something. Go ahead, Brent. Yeah, well, I was going to tell you a story. We we were at uh, one of our annual executive retreats, room full of of CIOs and you know, a lot of high power networking going on. And and one of the gentlemen says, "Well, the one of the big productivity hacks that I I, I personally implemented in the past year is that I, I only have meetings be between the hours of nine and twelve. And there was an audible gasp in the room, like it was one of those rare moments where like you could have heard a pin drop, all heads pivot." for this one gentleman and someone eventually said, what, what do you do with the rest of your time? And, and his answer was, was very straightforward and, and, and really cut to the heart of the matter. He said, my job? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do with your time? And this this has stuck with me ever since because I think this this is a a, a challenge that existed prior to COVID nineteen, prior to this unprecedented experiment with remote work policies. But the past year has made it much much worse. Absolutely. So now I'd like you to get into what the modes are. I've seen the graphic floating around on our social channels. It's, probably <laughs> it's on LinkedIn. 
right? So, uh, and we will we will get it to the the viewers of this, uh, put it on the resource center. But explain the four modes because I think also in the context of this conversation and what Mary's sharing about the pivoting back and forth, it's a it's a really nice construct now that we're in this new work environment. Absolutely. So I, I like to think of these as kind of four different tools in our collaboration toolkit, right? Each does a different job. Each provides distinct advantages, both to the employer as, as well as the employee. Uh, and the key here is really to be intentional about how and when we deploy each. So first, you've got working together, together, right? When teams are, are co-located, contributing to meetings in a shared physical space. Now, this, this is critical. It has been critical. It will continue to be critical because it will allow us to sustain our culture. Uh, it, it provides employees with the shared human connections that we desperately need right now. Uh, and in fact, this is why so many of the, the, the leaders that I talk to are actually rethinking the layout of their physical spaces right now in order to encourage more team and relationship building activities. Now, second, you've got working together apart. So when teams are distributed by, by participating in virtual meetings, so essentially what we've been doing for the last 15 months or so and what we are doing right now. Uh, and for many employees, the, the virtual location is now the default site for the employee experience. Uh, that provides employees with the flexibility that they need. It allows the organization to, to recruit from, from more diverse geographies. So let us now shift our attention from, from synchronous to asynchronous. So first up, you've got working alone together. So now teams are in shared spaces, not working uh, at, at the same time. So this could be in the office. Uh, this might even be in, in co-working spaces. So this helps drive tension. It provides autonomy. And our research is increasingly showing that this is uh, especially important for more junior talent who need those passive learning opportunities that, that co-location creates. And then finally, working alone apart. So when teams are distributed and individuals have the opportunity for deep or, or focused work, or as, as the CIO joked uh, all those many years ago, right, just doing their job, uh, this boosts resilience, it boosts well-being, it's it's also just a nice break from the, the, the chaos of, of open office plans and, and the, the never ending series of, of video meetings these days. So that's how we're thinking about the kind of four modes of collaboration, synchronous versus asynchronous, co-located versus distributed. Mary, do you have anything else to add in how you're seeing these ways of working be implemented for the, you know, the priorities that, that leaders have today? Okay, so yeah, I do. Um, first of all, the general meta question I think leaders have to ask is not is, is to avoid the assumption that remote versus in office is a location based thing. So what Brent said is you've got synchronous and asynchronous work and that's another aspect to this. It's not just are you in the office or are you at home or somewhere else? Are you working on something live together? Or are you working on something where it's just you doing your deep thinking wherever you may be right in the office in a coffee shop? at your home in your basement okay and so i so i guess my the meta question that leaders need to be asking is what kind of remote work like not what kind of work not just remote versus in office but what kind of work and there's a personal answer to that when do i do my best work and there's a team answer to that which is what kind of do we need to be synchronous do we really need to be on a team call do we not do can it be asynchronous in office out of office etc and then i think what i said at the very beginning you know really questioning the assumption that for the best innovations and the serendipity that Brent was talking about, you absolutely have to be physical, what do we say? Together, together, right? It has to be in office and it has to be in front of a whiteboard physically together and live. Are you sure? Like I would just check that, why? Because it really matters that employees not feel a sense of betrayal as we go back. And I use that word on purpose, betrayal, okay? They've largely brought it for like 16 months and they've contorted themselves into all sorts of positions to do that. Kids at home, homeschooling. I put my kids to bed that I'm back online at 11 p.m. I, you know, I'm doing Saturday mornings, I'm doing Friday nights. I'm caring for a sick parent. I'm also doing it. So they've largely earned the right to have some decision-making power in this. 
And the thing that will incite betrayal is this untested assumption, arbitrary decision. Oh, well, we're the suits in the organization. So we just thought it's innovation. So it has to happen in the office. Really? I think we've earned the right to test that. Does it really need to be together together or is some of that together apart? Or I'm not getting that right in my brain. Is some of that, you know, physically <laughs> together, but but uh, but alone or whatever, right? Just just testing that and being a little bit rigorous, I think, I think matters a lot because what is really hard to come back from is a sense of betrayal. You know, you just made an arbitrary decision on our behalf when we'd earned the right to participate in that decision. So yeah, I'm leaving. And if it's tech talent we're talking about, a client last week described the tech talent problem as the Hunger Games. It's the Hunger Games out there. Like if you're not offering what your employees want and need, especially in, in, in the West, in these geographies, they're gonna leave. So we have a retention problem that is real and tangible and immediate if we don't think in more rigorous terms about remote work versus in-office work. Yeah. There's a lot uh, at stake. Um, just just a, a, a quick thought there that I wanted to add, Mary. I, I absolutely love the point you make about right testing, being explicit about the assumptions that we're making, testing those assumptions, as well as asking the higher order question. Um, and and this is you know kind of the, the the way that conversation is playing out for me in, in in the calls that that I do is you know a lot of folks in HR will come to us with questions about you know how often folks should be in the office and 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 when uh, as if we could somehow produce an algorithm so all knowing and all powerful that you can input a couple variables and it will tell you that you know Brent Castle should be in the office on Tuesdays between three and four fifteen Eastern Standard Time. Um, but I'm always trying to tell folks like look. Yes, we need to have the conversation about how often and when. These are important questions. We, we should address them. But let us not forget the, the, the more important question, which is not when or how often, but why. Why am I coming into the office? What can I do there that I cannot do at home, right? To, to put it in the language of economics, like what, what is the, the comparative advantage of that shared office space. And then as we have those conversations, I think to, to your point, it's important to, to step back every now and then and say, really? Like it's been 16 months. And, and to your point, people have done some of the best work of their careers. It's not just productivity that's up, it's performance. So I think we need to ask ourselves those questions, but we also need to approach some of our knee jerk responses with a healthy dose of skepticism let's say, to make sure that we do not once again default to the way we've always done things around here. I think accidental backsliding is a really big deal. You know, so accidental backsliding to just this is what I'm used to, not a great idea, not a great retention strategy, to your point, Brent, but also just um, just making sure that you're asking the question, why, why do we have to be the ones to make this call? So a lot of the most successful organizations that I've talked to are saying we're pushing that decision down to the team level. They can figure it out. Why do we have to choose Tuesdays versus Wednesdays? And every team is different with their own diet. Why should that be an executive leader or HR leader call? Do we really need to be the ones making that decision? And I get the stress out there. You know, oh my gosh, if we let everybody decide, it's going to be absolute chaos. But there again, we just want to be iterative, right? Try new things, revisit every quarter, have some principles that guide your effort. And you can keep changing the manifestations of those as you go. I think that's a much better way to go. Absolutely. Makes sense. Okay, final question. What advice would you have for companies that are struggling to rethink innovation and collaboration in the hybrid work environment? So for those companies that are still, after all of this great in, insight and advice, they're still, mm -hmm. they're really stuck. And we know they're out there and messages change, they can't quite figure out which direction to go in. What's your advice? Yeah. Brent, let's start with you. Yeah. Sure. So to, to paraphrase one of our clients this year, and arguably by extension, Yoda, uh, you, you have to unlearn what you've learned, right? Too often we default to that synchronous mode of collaboration, whether it's in a conference room or it's on WebEx, because it's what we've always done, uh, because it's, it's, it's a habit. Uh, not because we are making a, a conscious decision about the best way to collaborate and innovate in the 21st century. Um, we would also encourage organizations to create boundaries, right? To limit the amount of time that employees dedicate 
to synchronous collaboration in the form of meetings while simultaneously giving them the opportunity to block time on their calendar for that asynchronous work. And as, as, as lovely as that soundbite is about meeting free Monday, it, it rolls off the tongue. I would encourage people to think about doing that every day, not once a week. Um, one other thing I'd mention is I think it is absolutely critical uh, for leaders to model this flexibility, uh, to, to let employees play a greater role in designing their work week, right? A lot of organizations I talk to, you know, they, they stop short. They say, yes, absolutely. We will allow employees and managers to create these new patterns of flexible work together, but all senior leaders will be in every day between nine to five. And it's, it's such a miss because you could have the platonic ideal of, of hybrid work principles, but if, if my boss and my boss's boss and so on and so forth of the chain of command are in the office every day, then the message that I'm going to get, the signal that I'm going to hear from them is that if I want to inhabit that corner office one day, then I too must go in. So remember, it's it's hard out there right now. It's, it's confusing, but don't forget, we see greater agility, psychological safety, equity, uh, we see uh, uh, better innovation from hybrid teams than we do from those that are uh, uh, forced to co-locate together in the same physical space in the office. So if, if you're going through a tough time right now, know that you're not alone. To Mary's point, know that this is something we will build together. This is something that we'll iterate on uh, and and try to, to, to grant yourself a, a, a little grace, right? Some permission to to experiment, to make mistakes along the way. Mary, closing thoughts? Um, I have two. Okay, one is innovation specific, so it's not really to do with collaboration, which is just please, please, please do not be the people who are just innovating. And you go, well, why are you innovating? And they go, well, because we should be innovating. Because that's not compelling. If it were, I would eat spinach and kale every day instead of chocolate, which is right here on my desk every day. <laughs> And I would, you know, work out and I would do all, I'd call my mom more and I'd read the classic. There's a lot of things. Human beings are not motivated to do things just because they should. So have a more rigorous definition of why you're innovating. What are you trying to do here? That is a, that's nothing to do with collaborative work environments or hybrid work environment. That's just a true statement that lots of enterprises miss. So that's the innovation one. On the specific situation we're in now, I guess a behavior I would really encourage is please, and this we talked about way at the beginning of the pandemic, I feel like, Heather, but I'm going to bring it back, which is please avoid teenager problem solving. So what do I mean by that? I mean, teenagers, and we've all been there, okay, have this tendency to think in binary terms about problems. You know, I love him. Oh, my gosh, we're going to be married. We're going to be together forever and ever and ever. I hate him. Oh, my gosh, I have to leave school. We have to leave the, like, leave the country. I love my mom. I hate my mom. I write everything is binary that's just part of the adolescent experience right and when we are under pressure humans often get binary too like we have to have an answer for everything and oh my gosh we have to have the rule that rings them all that, that rules them all the ring that rules them all and we have to have this perfect plan or we have to have total chaos it's going to be crazy if we don't really i feel like one thing leaders should be really embracing right now is um non-binary problem solving which says if you have this um extreme and this extreme what's in the middle so for example government organizations a lot of them have a mandate that comes from cabinet or the equivalent parliamentary the equivalent governance system saying this is what you shall do we're going to have three days in the office and and leaders i'm talking to in their particular departments don't get to choose that so a non-binary way to solve that problem would, would be not just to roll over and go i guess that's it then it would be to say okay but did they specify exactly when we need to start? Because I have like a lot of people working for me who just want that extra half hour in the morning before they jump in the car. Because you know what they've gotten addicted to? No surprise. Being the first face their kid sees in the morning and giving their kid that warm kiss on the cheek and that little tickle. And they don't want to give that up. And you know, they could preserve that if we could just say, come to the office at 9.30 instead of 9. That's not stipulated. How about we try that? So just trying to be a little non-binary in the way you solve problems, it's not always the extremes. What inhabits the middle, I think will help guide leaders as they figure this out as we go. I love it. 
Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Brent. Terrific insight. As always, we look forward to seeing our next guest next week, same time, same place. Thank you all for joining us. If you would like to continue your journey learning more about how to reinvent the future of work, visit the Gartner Client Resource Center on your client portal, or we have a public resource center with articles, videos, webinars, and complimentary research. Go to Gartner.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.